Hello and welcome to this late afternoon conversation with NPR's Aisha Roscoe and KPCC's Libby Denkman. My name is Rob Risco. I oversee the Leadership Circle program here at KPCC. As all of you know, member support is our largest source of support here at KPCC. Everything you hear on the air and read online is made possible because of your generosity and we can't thank you enough. Today's conversation is sure to be excellent. Aisha Roscoe is the White House correspondent for NPR, where she's covered the last three presidential administrations. She's also a regular on the NPR politics podcast, as well as pop culture happy hour. Libby Denkman is KPCC in LA's senior politics reporter, where she leads our conversation on election coverage. You can also hear her as a regular fill-in host on Air Talk with Larry Mantle. Uh, tonight's program will run for about an hour. We'll have about 40 minutes of a conversation between these two powerhouse reporters, and the last 20 minutes or so will be open for Q&A. We're in the Zoom webinar format, so if you have any questions you want to ask throughout the presentation or at the end for either Aisha or Libby, just type them into the Q&A at the window, and we will absolutely get to them. Thank you all for coming. Here's Aisha and here's Libby. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for joining us and for supporting KPCC. The Leadership Circle is such an important source of support here uh, for our newsroom and our coverage in Southern California. And thank you, Aisha, for joining us. I'm very excited. You are a reporter I look up to so much at NPR, and uh, I'm excited to get to talk to you. Uh, you know, first off, just warm up question. Uh, what was the path that led you from being a newspaper a Reuters reporter to uh, an NPR reporter uh, and, and being on the radio? It is definitely not a journey that I expected, <laughs> but I, I always saw myself as a print reporter. I went to Howard University and I majored in print as it's called. I don't even think they call it that now, um, but- Yeah, I'm so old you know, fashioned, I called it print. <laughs> like, yes, yeah, what is yeah. That? Yeah, but I, I, was, I wanted to be print. I didn't take any broadcast courses. I didn't think that I was that good at speaking. Uh, or being on camera or radio. And I just felt like I, you know, I was a writer and that was what I felt like that was my medium. And so I, I, I went to Reuters and, and I covered energy policy for a long time, covered some of the, the biggest energy stories out of Washington, the, the shale gas revolution and, and whether you were gonna you know, endorse fracking or regulate fracking. Uh, I covered the BP oil spill, the response to that. I covered uh, the, you know, the, the response to the meltdown in Fukushima in Japan. Uh, people may remember that. And then over time, I ended up becoming a White House reporter. And I covered the last year of the Obama administration and the first year of the Trump administration. And that's when there started to be a lot more emphasis on the, the briefing room, as everybody knows and remembers. And they started to be carried live. And, and I started getting asked to do TV and radio. And I had never done it before. But once I did it, I, I got bit by the bug. And I I liked it, uh, and I, I thought, oh, I, maybe I can do this. And I, I, I was at Reuters for a decade, so I think it was time I wanted to challenge myself and take on something new. And so when NPR came knocking, I you know, made the jump, and it, it's been great, and I'm so glad that I did. Well, you're such a welcome voice and face, and I'm so glad you did. You you came over to the to the broadcast side. <laughs> um, what do you notice about storytelling, and maybe even just the way you gather news, the things that you notice when you're on a scene or or out in in uh, you know, interviewing people? How is that process of reporting changed since you made the jump uh, to storytelling on the radio? It's so different because part of it is, I feel like when you're you're telling a, a story with audio, it's almost like you, you. It's almost like I feel like it's like a music. It's it's like a rhythm to it. You have to think in a totally different way. Uh, I feel I, I say it's like using another part of your brain 
when you are doing something for audio. Uh, and a lot of times when you're writing, you have a lot of flowery language that you use and you, you use these phrases that you would never use in real life amid, in the midst of, and all these things. And, you know, when I came to NPR, they were like, look, you got to strip all of that out. That's not radio. You wouldn't talk that way. That's the way you would write it. That's not the way that you would speak it. And so you really have to think about how would you say, how would you tell this story to a friend? And I feel like it really forced me to kind of get down to the nitty gritty. What is the point? Because you only have a few minutes <laughs> and the timing is very tight. And so you don't have you don't have time to, to be all, you know, get every single detail. What is the key point? How would you say this in language that people use? And then you just got to get it out there. But I, I really love being able to do that. And I feel like people connect in a different way with radio. When they hear okay. your voice, when they hear my voice or and they hear people telling their stories, it, it, it gives a different reaction uh, than reading about it. Even though obviously written stories can touch you deeply, it's something about hearing that voice or hearing a, a, a catch in someone's voice that it, 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 it touches people. People feel like they know you. Yeah, absolutely. There's an intimacy and there's a connection that's forged with audio that is so different and even different from television. I found like when you're yeah. it's it, television is, you know, you have it on in a room and kind of other people can join you, but oftentimes folks have us in their earbuds and it's so, mm. it's such a personal connection and the way that listeners react is, is so different. Um, one thing when you said the language is different and the way that you, you know, choose more conversational uh, ways to tell the news. The other day I had an edit and my editor asked, do you say rebuke in everyday life? <laughs> and I yeah. thought, no, no, yeah. I don't. <laughs> But that's I'll a great that written word. That's a great yes. written word. Like, you know, to say, you know, yeah. they got rebuked is it? but in, in usual life, unless you're in my evangelical church, we're not rebuking people might rebuke, <laughs> Satan, but we're not usually <laughs> in everyday life. We're not generally rebuking people. Yeah. Um, not today, but, Satan. Yeah. I rebuke you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, but that was something I really had to, I had to change my whole approach because, and I had to start telling myself, oh, that's the way I would write it. It's not the way I would say it. Well, you have been covering, I mean, roller coaster. I don't know what the word possibly is for the time that you have been uh, covering the White House through the Trump administration and to today. Um, partisanship, of course, it has become more of a factor over the years. It's always been there, but I hear from political reporters all the time and just people every day in everyday life saying that they feel it's more entrenched and it's more a part of folks' identity. How do you approach your job and even navigating relationships in everyday life with the increasing partisanship that um, is really fragmenting our country in a lot of ways it, it's it's tough and in some senses I mean obviously the foundation of journalism what we try to do is and I, I think that you know certainly everyone at NPR what we're trying to do is go out there and be as fair as possible and to uh, shine a light on things to to ask questions to interrogate uh, ideas and, and we're trying to do that in a way that's not leaning to one side or the other, but leaning toward the truth. Like that's where the bias is, it's toward the truth. Uh, but obviously we live in a day and age now where the truth is very much up for debate and even things, facts, this happened on this day, we saw it, that is in dispute. And people will feel like if you say there's no evidence that, um, you know, the election in 2020 was that there was widespread fraud, people will take that as a political view when it's just a statement of fact. So I, I think that it's, it's, it is difficult, but what I try to do is to just stay true to, I am trying to stay the, state the truth. I am trying to be fair. 
And I, I want to ask questions, not to score points. I can only speak for myself. I don't try to score points when I'm asking questions or in the briefing room. What I'm trying to do is ask legitimate questions to try to understand or to try to get a better understanding of what is happening um, for the public and for people to understand how this government is like intersecting with their lives. And so that's what I try to do. Now, sometimes that may sound like people on all sides will say, oh, you're being too tough, you're being too easy, you're being too this, or you're too that. And, and all I have to do is say, okay, do I feel okay with the questions that I asked, with, the, with what I wrote, do I feel like it's fair? Do I feel like I have been honest about everyone's positions, giving them a fair standing and, and just try to stand in that? How is the briefing room different, the energy, just since the Biden administration has taken over and, you know, has the, the makeup of the press corps changed significantly? Is there anything, you know, that you notice uh, that that stands out about the differences between who was in the, the Trump briefing room or the feel of it to mm -hmm. today in the Biden administration? Well, the big difference is we're having briefings at the end. We didn't we didn't even oh, yeah. have briefings during the Trump administration. <laughs> so we're having briefings. And they look, there is there's push and pull. Uh, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki has no problem um, you know, you know, going back and forth with the press a bit. She has has no issue doing that. It's less personal though. I I, I think during the Trump administration, it got very, very personal uh and it got very um it, well it was certainly volatile and it and it became more like a campaign setting now every single presidency when they get behind that you know the lectern whatever you call it, i always get confused po podium lectern but when they get behind is there that, a difference somebody's gonna difference. tell us that there's, there's a, a difference di i think the podium is the platform <laughs> they're, they're gonna say it's a difference but whatever the, when they stand behind that thing um they are trying to spin and they are saying putting things in the best light for the administration there will be disputes about the answers that they give and how, whether they're actually answering the questions or they're just kind of filibustering. That is always the case. So I'm not trying to make it seem as if um, now the Biden administration is just, you know, telling us exactly the raw, unedited truth. They are not. They are telling it from their perspective. But I think during the Trump administration, it was obviously confrontational, and that was because. Former President Trump wanted it to be confrontational and he he called the press the enemy of the people. And that's the way the dynamic really was. Um, that's not the dynamic now. It's more of a traditional push and pull. There's definitely, you know, tensions and going back and forth and reporters getting frustrated and the White House getting frustrated, but it's less on a on a deeply uh, personal, like you're an evil type level. Um, in, on a day-to-day -day basis. I have to say, when you talk about, you know, reporters getting called out and it getting personal, I feel as though you're at the kind of epicenter, right, of where these things start and then they trickle out. Like when they were starting on the campaign trail for President Trump and then in the briefing rooms with whoever happened to be the press secretary at the time, you saw candidates across the country learning from that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm on the state side level where I'm reporting from Los Angeles. And I was in Orange County recently at a Larry Elder rally, who's one of the, or is the, the front running candidate to take over for Gavin Newsom if the recall is successful. And folks at the lectern or podium, whatever it was, uh, are calling out the media and saying, oh, mm -hmm. MSNBC is here, CNN's here, NPR is here. And I hope they get me right. I hope they, you know, don't misquote me, but it becomes like being pointed out in a crowd full of people mm -hmm. and you feel the mm -hmm. energy shift. And these are things that I had never experienced when I first got into reporting and, and being in radio 15 years ago. Uh, and now I have this armor up that when I go to public events, I am definitely on the, on the lookout for that type of dynamic to start in a crowd. Um, I think that, I mean, that's a hard lesson I've learned from, especially the recent years of reporting. I wonder if there are hard lessons that you've learned from the White House briefing room or whatever other reporting, um, 
on politics that you've done recently? It's, it, it is, there has certainly been a shift. Uh, what happened during the last administration showed that you could really target the, the media and that you could use the, the media as an opponent. Uh, and, and look, people always, every administration bashed the media, but this was a different level and it was very much, um, you know, personalized and, and, and meant to get people worked up and to feel like you can't trust anything that uh, the media says and that they are the enemy, uh, that they are bad people. Uh, and, and eventually, and some people, I, I feel like at the rallies and stuff like that, you would see them booing CNN and all that stuff. And then they would take selfies with the CNN anchors. So I think for some people, it was like a joke. It was like, it was just, you know, this is, I think it was almost like sports. It was like, this is my team. I'm booing that you're on the other team and I'm going to boo you. And that's what their view was. But I think for some people, it was very serious. It wasn't a joke to them. It was something where they really feel like uh, the press is an enemy and that they need something needs to be done about them. And I, I think we saw some of that on January 6th. And, and we've seen that in reporters being attacked even just this week, Shaquille Brewster of, I think, M MSNBC, uh, he was attacked or, you know, accosted live on air. So I, I think some people definitely don't take it as a joke. And I don't know if I've learned anything from it. I, I will say that it has, it was hard and I'm a human being. And so even though you can put up that armor, I can't say that it didn't affect me, you know, having people talk about you and call you names and do all of this stuff, even if it's just online, it doesn't, I'm a human being and, and it does affect me. Yeah. Uh, we had our, our own Frank Stoltz here, our public safety reporter who has been in the game forever. And for the very first time he was attacked a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago in front of Los Angeles city hall, uh, somebody who was an anti-vaccine protester, uh, kicked him and took his glasses. I don't know if Frank ever got those glasses back. There was a police report taken, but um, we've never seen that before. I mean, that is totally new. Um, when we talk about partisanship and the ethos of, of uh, journalism and really trying to come to a story with an open mind and, and presenting the facts, there is also this evolving conversation in journalism about bias and what it means to be unbiased and traditionally mm -hmm. what that has meant, which has been frankly, white men who ran the newsrooms forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think there's a reckoning going on about who gets to tell stories and whose experience is considered disqualifying or a bias versus mm -hmm. a benefit to a story. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could explore that with me and how you are coming to this issue and, and grappling with it? Yes, it, it, it is uh, It is a reckoning. And I don't think that uh, journalism has really fully come to terms with that. I am glad that people are now looking at this issue of bias and what that meant. You know, the, the idea that, well, if I haven't had interactions with the police, therefore I am not biased, um, even though well, that, it, that could color your perspective, right? The fact that you haven't had interactions with the police or that you know your loved ones are not pulled over regularly by the police uh, could certainly be part of what is coloring your reaction uh, to the news. And I think that there really has to be some soul searching. And, and I, I don't believe that there's, that there are many people or, or certainly not mainstream reporters who are out there saying, we want to take an opinion and we want to, to advocate for a specific opinion. But I do think that there are a lot of people who want to be able to talk about how some of the things that are just taken for granted in, in certain circles uh, and consider the Ob objective is not everyone's objective reality. That's that's not you know the way things are in my neighborhood. It doesn't look like that, or or my interactions with these groups don't look like that. And and um and I I I've talked about this often when it comes to misinformation. A lot of people will talk about 
Uh, certainly there are some conservatives who have decided they don't trust the media, especially during the Trump administration. But there were communities, uh, people of color who have felt like they have not been represented in the media for a very long time and they have not trusted the media. Uh, and for some reason that wasn't considered a crisis. And so I think that when we're looking at trust in the media, we can't just look at it through like a Democrat Republican lens, but you also have to look at it at all these communities that feel like, okay, people only come around when there's a shooting, they tell this story of woe, and then they leave, they drop in, they say this place is crime ridden, and they, you know, tell some sad story, and then they go. And that's not the reality, right? Like that is not the full story of reality, but that's the only thing that you hear or see in the media. And so if we come out of this moment and we haven't dealt with all those stories that continue to be remain untold, we will be leaving a lot on the table and not dealing with some of the very real roots of distrust. And so I, I, I hope that in this moment, and I don't have all the answers, but I hope that in this moment, that people really start thinking about the way we tell stories, who we allow to tell stories, just as you said, who we allow to tell those stories and, and, and the perspectives that we allow, because there are a lot of perspectives out there that don't never get no coverage, <laughs> you know, that they were not, they are totally, you are not going to hear this perspective. It's out there. Um, and so we, we have to, I think, kind of deal with that and think about how how we decide what we want to put out there and interrogate and deal with. And we want to show the other side of this. Well, there might be another side that you really don't want to show. Why, why, why not that? Why this contrarian take and not that one? So I, I think we need to kind of uh, look into that. Yeah. Which, which takes are considered extremist, which are considered <laughs> just like balance. Um... Yeah, just balance. Yeah. <laughs> like there are a lot of takes that you might hear in the bar or in your neighborhood that you would not hear on in, in regular media because that would be way out of the norm. And I'm not saying that every uh, every viewpoint needs to be, um, you know, given a platform, but I, ha I think when you, it needs to be examined, why do we allow certain viewpoints that would seem extreme to some people to be out there, but others not? Why are we allow, what type of conversations are we allowing and why? And really think about that. Yeah, and, and at risk of using an overused word in the media conversation now, who are we centering? Yes. Whose perspective are we really putting at the forefront? I think about the Washington Post journalist right now who's in a dispute with her employer who was um, the victim of a sexual assault and she was taken off coverage of uh, sexual assault issues because of that. And how does that decision get made? And what are the gatekeepers there that are sort of, you know, legacy media and how can we evolve and change and, and really address that? Um, for you uh, as, a, as a political reporter, it often comes down to left and right. When, mm -hmm. when you show up places or you pitch, you know, somebody, Mitch McConnell's spokesperson on getting an interview. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you've talked to Mitch lately, but <laughs> I'm sure he's not easy to get a hold of. Um, you know, is it immediate? The, the reaction that I often get is immediately, okay, well, what are you, what point are you trying to prove with this? What perspective are you coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, what's your uh, angle is not even the right word for it. Like basically, are, are you on the left or are you on the right? And mm. are you, what points are you trying to score? Um, do you encounter that in your job? You know, if you're trying to talk to people in the White House or on the Hill? Not necessarily. I, I, I will say it, it, sometimes I think it depends. NPR has, there's definitely a name brand to NPR. And for the most part, when I reach out to people, they're willing to, to, to call me back have a conversation. Sometimes it does take time. During the Trump administration, uh, there was a, a particular official who I spoke with a lot. And by the end of it, he said, thank you for always being fair. Thank you for, you, you know, and it wasn't that my stories were, you know, nice or anything like that. But by the end of it, it took multiple stories and multiple times dealing with this official for this official to say, okay, you were fair to us, like you weren't out to get us. 
Um, but I, I think it goes both ways. I think sometimes people can think, uh, oh, you're out to get us. And then sometimes people think that, oh, oh you're on our side or you're supposed to be, take it easy on yes. us. And so there can be, there's that note. So there's that push and that pull is like, well, why are you being so hard on us? When it's like, well, I'm hard on everybody. Like, these are questions that I'm going to ask. I, I don't care what party you're invested in. I'm not your cheerleader. I'm a reporter um, and I don't work for you. I, I, I work, I really feel like I work for the public. And, and so it, it goes both ways, Every, but I, I think there are people who feel like, I always laugh when you hear people talk about the journey, uh, talk about the media and they're like, oh, I'm sure they're celebrating now because of this and that. <laughs> or because this politician's doing that, or I'm sure they're, and then you have the very, uh, the, the other side going, oh, I'm sure they're happy. They don't have to do hard coverage anymore. And I'm like, I don't see any of that. Like, I think that people are really, I'm not saying the media doesn't have issues, but I can, I'm trying to do my job. I'm not trying to bring anybody down or bring anybody up. I'm really trying to inform people. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm really not trying to uh, do, if it, I'm not trying to take anybody down or bring anybody up. I'm just trying to tell the truth. But I think people generally don't believe that. Yeah, I've I've definitely encountered both the the sense of betrayal when you have yeah. a pushback question and people are like, "What? I'm so shocked." Um, who's on your your wish list right now in terms of you know people that you're most interested in getting access to, people you wish you had more access to, um, or people who you feel like or issues you feel like you haven't been able to really drill down on. Well, as a White House reporter, you always want to either, you know, interview the president or the vice president. That's always the, the top goal. Like, can I, you know, to interview them? I, I, you know, I think that Susan Rice plays a very interesting role now. Uh, she's over the, the D Domestic Policy Council and the White House, and they're supposed to be uh, focusing more on equity. I, I would certainly want to, and that's one of my focuses, what I've tried to focus on some this year is equity and, and what that actually will look like in practice and because they've said it's one of their pillars uh and, and so that's something that i i would love to dig in more and i do like criminal to to talk about criminal justice issues uh there are issues regarding clemency and you know people let out because of the coronavirus and crowd, overcrowding in the federal system and what happens to them. So those are some of the things on my wish list that I I would love to um, to to talk you know to someone about um, on the serious side on the not serious side. Um, I do I watch a lot of reality shows. So anytime I could talk to like um, someone from the Real Housewives of Potomac <laughs> or something like that, I would love. <laughs> to do that on the on the non-serious side yeah sure that, yeah yeah Oprah is on the wish list I love talk to Oprah. yeah yeah I mean so. Susan Rice Real Housewife is you know. yeah, either one you know they're both pretty cool so both would make it, Aisha yes, happy they would both make me really happy yeah <laughs> Well, uh, you know, on a more uh, slightly more serious note, um, I did see Jen Psaki, who you interact with all the time as the uh, she's, uh, you know, runs the briefings and is mm -hmm. the spokesperson for the president. And she uh, really uh, hit back at a reporter who had asked about uh, President Biden and his Catholic faith and mm -hmm. why he supported access to abortion in the country. And I wonder when you see um, Jen Psaki sort of going after, I mean, in, in like a sense, she just was saying, you, you as a male reporter have not been mm -hmm. pregnant. You don't know what this is like. Um, how do you react in the press room? And how does that sort of, um, you know, shape the questions that you might ask? Do you move mm -hmm. on from that? Do you try to push back if there is a question that maybe isn't uh, directly mm -hmm. answered. It doesn't have to be on that topic, but just in general, how do you as a press corps sort of work together or move on from mm -hmm. when things get dicey? 
Yeah, no, and things often get dicey in in the press room. It, 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 it's really, that's a good question. The, the press corps, the White House press corps, we all know each other really well. And a lot of us travel together well, when there was travels, not much travel now, or you're on these really long pools with each other. So you get to know people in the White House press and a pool is, you know, kind of when you're hanging out with the president when he goes golfing or whatever he's doing. Um, and you may sit in vans for a very long time. Um, and so you get to know the people in the White House press corps very well. I, I would say that a lot of times when people are in the press room and people would get very upset about this, especially during the Trump administration, they would say, well, why didn't everyone just stay on this one question? And it is it does boil down to individuals and you have to, when you're in the room, you have to read the room and make decisions based on a whole host of things. Um, so we're not all working together. We all have very different audiences, right? We all have different goals, different aspirations, different things we're working on. And so sometimes when you're in the press room, there may be a question that you have to ask. Like I someone has told you we really need this question in or you have a story that's running tomorrow i have to ask this question so it may not matter what the person asked before i don't care i have a question i need to ask um sometimes it may be i'm on tv and i i'm going to ask someone already asked the question but i'm gonna ask this question because my network needs me asking this question oh <laughs> so yeah that, interesting so that can happen. But, but what I try to do is if it's, if it's not a situation where I absolutely have to ask a question, I try to read the room. And so sometimes it can be very clear. And if, if that in that exchange or other exchanges with Jen Psaki, it's like, she's not going to answer it. OK, if this has been tried three times, they've gone at it three different ways. It'll be like, OK, she's not going to answer it. So I'm not going to waste my question on that. I'm just going to ask something else. Or sometimes a topic has been you know, you feel like they beat the dead horse. It's like, okay, we, we, we've explored it. Now I want to move on. Sometimes though, if you get the first question, you might like recently, I got the first question to Jake Sullivan. And I think it was the first time he was answering questions about Afghanistan in the briefing room after the fall of the Taliban. And so I, when I got the first question, I felt like I had to set this tone for the room, right? Like, so then I have to ask a broad question, not a really super detailed question. I, I look at it like I'm gonna set the tone. So I ask, what does President Trump, I mean, Trump, oh my goodness, President Biden, are uh, they all mixed up together? What does President <laughs> Biden, you know, what does he take responsibility for? He says the buck stops with him. But well, what is he actually taking responsibility for? Is he, is he taking responsibility for the chaos? Is he taking responsibility for any bloodshed? So I felt like I had to ask a question that was broad and, and, and setting the tone for the room. So sometimes, and if you get a question at the end, you may ask something that's totally off or something very detailed that didn't get that she, that they tried to dance around before, right? So then you try to get them to really like nail down on what are you really trying to say here? So it's a, it's a weird thing, but it's like you're trying to gauge the room and see when am I getting this question and what did everybody else ask and what can I ask now and how can I ask something different? And so it's, it's, that's what I do. I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I can speak for myself. That's what I do. Hmm. You talked about asking the first question to Jake Sullivan on Afghanistan, and I imagine that NPR has, you know, correspondents, they have you in the room, they have folks, editors at the mothership, what we call it, you know, in, in DC, the NPR headquarters, they have correspondents in different parts of the world. How do you work together to make sure you're asking the questions that are needed and how do those dynamics sort of play out? Well, usually we do ask around, you know, in the Slack channel, we'll, you know, be going, hey guys, what are some questions that we need to ask? And, you know, usually our editors will tell us, uh, may tell us, oh, this, they're working on this or somebody's working on this. Um, they want to see if you can get answers 
And, and so, and sometimes if you're working on a story, you'll say, or if you know, you'll say, they never answered this question. They haven't talked about this. Can you find out something about this? So definitely sometimes it's, it's brainstorming together in Slack, different questions uh, that, you know, might be worth asking. Sometimes if the president has a formal press conference, you might come up with questions and then brainstorm together and work on the questions and things like that. Like it, it, it depends, but that's usually the way it is. It's just kind of talking to the editors, talking to different reporters and seeing if they have something like, do you have something pressing that you think hasn't been asked that needs to be asked? The hard thing is when issues are evolving and uh, the factors are changing and you just don't know what the current, um, you know, line is from the White House or if the president has changed his perspective. For me, it's often, you know, the mayor or local politicians here in Los Angeles that we cover. Um, yesterday, I had a conversation with uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who had said for weeks that she, you know, wasn't considering running for mayor here in LA. And there had been rumors that maybe she was open to it. We didn't know. And so I got access to her for a completely different story about the recall. And at the end, I'm just throwing in, by the way, what about that mayoral run? And she, mm. for the first time says, actually, I am really seriously considering it. And the, mm. you know, voices that have been, you know, chirping my ear and on social media, that there's this progressive push to get Karen Bass to, to leave Congress and, and run here in LA. Um, I've heard them and actually I am now considering it. And so that was a shift from just a matter of weeks ago when she said, no, that I'm, you know, I'm focused on uh, uh, being reelected to Congress, but it's sort of like having your antenna, your feelers out and knowing, you know, yeah. that these things are in the air. And if you ask the right question, you can crack it open, but um, you really have to be aware and, you know, on your toes. And then sometimes you realize you didn't ask it and you're just <laughs> kicking yourself because yeah. like you said, you're, you're uh, representing people and you're, you're really the voice for a lot of people who, who want to know and be informed. Um, you know, uh, have you ever in the, in the room or with a major politician, have you ever uh, really had a, a big exchange that meant somebody like got up and left and <laughs> like threw their microphone, <laughs> threw their, Thanks. their lav mic off or, um, you know, what's the, what's the kind of the most memorable like interview moment that you've had? No, I haven't had that. I think the, the biggest moment I had in the briefing room was with uh, Mick Mulvaney and that this was, uh, you know, during, it was before impeachment, right? It was when that the first impeachment of President uh, Trump, and then there was the question of this call, they had released the transcript, and Mick Mulvaney came out, I think, to talk about the budget, uh, even though he was chief of staff, I think he was talking about something else, but he came out and he was just like, look, it's not a problem for the president, if he wanted you know, to, to ask for an investigation, there's no problem with that. And then, um, and, and essentially he seemed to be admitting like, well, was there a quid pro quo? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, and, and so there was a, an exchange with him where I was like, well, well, wait a minute, hold up. Are you saying that it's okay to hold up <laughs> funds for, you know, in exchange for a criminal investigation that would be uh, ostensibly of your opponent. Um, and he kind of stumbled and then he gave these three reasons why um, that didn't really add up with what the White House had already been saying um, and really seemed to incriminate the president more. And he you know, it was it was an exchange that got a lot of attention um, because it, it was not helpful to the president. And I think some of that vi video was used during the impeachment proceedings <laughs> against Trump. You became um, evidence. It became evidence against him um, because he got kind of he got over his skis a bit um, and he actually had to clarify his answer. He had to put out a statement and walk back what he answered, what he said to me. Um, and so that was the, the, the biggest exchange. But he wasn't angry about it. He was, try, he, he was trying to 
explain, but it, it, it became more incriminating than mm. just an explanation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're going to uh, open it up to questions from folks uh, who are uh, asking in the Q&A uh, section of the chat here. And I'm going to pull up our first question from our leadership circle, who, again, I'm so happy to be with this evening. Um, and I'm talking with Aisha Roscoe, White House correspondent for NPR News. I'm Libby Dankman, the politics reporter at KPCC in Los Angeles. And let's see, I got a first question coming in here. It's from Jamie uh, Jaime Moss. Uh, who uh, says during the 2016 presidential election, uh, some thought that the press was not diligent enough in pressing former President Trump regarding false statements. But now if congressional members like Marjorie Ta Taylor Greene or uh, Jordan or even Graham, does it even matter if they are presented with facts? How can the press help with that? So uh, talking about sort of fact checking in the moment, pushing back, and you know when you're confronting a member of Congress or a member of an administration that doesn't seem to respond to facts, um, you know how do you deal with that? I, I it, the thing of I, I think part of the issue is that there are politicians who have who feel like and have gotten the message that they don't have to speak accurately uh, and that there's no consequence for that from the voters. I don't think that most politicians really care about the press. Um, we can correct them. I do think we should correct them for the record and for the public. Uh, but ultimately, uh, for a lot of uh, politicians, they can take being corrected by the press and and use that to their benefit the press is against me look i i show them if they try to go back at the press or you know look at how i you know they didn't even know what they were talking about I, we're in this age where you can have one video and you could have someone put it out look at this person owned this person and the other side will say oh no the other person got owned people can just spin it however they want to so I think the press has a, a, a duty to fact check and to speak the truth. Um, but some of it, I, I do think, has to come from the public. Politicians have to feel like there's a consequence for them not telling the truth. And at this point, it doesn't really seem to be the press that is going to, to make them make that change. I, I think maybe voters could have more of an impact. I feel like there's a real difficulty too in live interviews or when you have a limited amount of time like you do in the briefing room at the White House, how much you push back in the moment and try yeah. to fact check versus move on to your next topic because the person is going to stop the whole thing down mm -hmm. and it'll grind to a halt and then you can't get anything else from them and there's no more information to be revealed. And when it just turns into a back and forth about one fact check, there's only so much you can do in the moment yeah. because that's where they're digging their heels in. That's where they're going to stay. And if you, you know, I hear this criticism from say like morning edition hosts or all things considered hosts when they have contentious interviews and there's this real push and pull about what you can do in the moment versus when you have to move on and keep the conversation going. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's another factor with, with all of this and, and the business that we're in. Um, Marvin Ramirez is asking a question and Marvin says, listening to this discussion about centering, I really do think that more women need to be involved in deciding what and how a newsroom will report. Do either of you feel that you can be a part of the decision-making editing team? Snaps for Marvin. Yes, more <laughs> women all the time. Thanks, Marvin. Um, how do you feel about your ability, Aisha, to uh, you know, decide from an editorial standpoint, what you're going to cover and what kind of stories you're going to do. I have a, a lot of I have a lot of freedom to pitch stories. I, I felt like since I've been at NPR that there's been a lot of openness to the ideas that I come at them with, uh, the things that I want to try to explore. I haven't had faced a lot of pushback on that. 
sometimes it can be difficult just because of time and there's so much breaking news and there's so many, many things happening that you have to get done that sometimes it's harder to get those longer pieces just to find the time to do them. But I, 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 I feel like it is important to have people who can offer um who can offer different ideas and fresh ideas. And so I do try to do that in my, my day-to-day work. Uh, but I, I also think it's important to have women and, and people of color and other marginalized, uh, who, rep- who represent marginalized groups in you know positions of power, positions of hiring, positions of deciding the kind of the thrust of the entire newsroom, what we're gonna focus on, what's important to us. Uh, as a newsroom. And, and so I do think that you need more of those people in those spaces. One person isn't going to be enough. One woman is not enough. It, it is, you have to really try to uh, make it be throughout the entire, the, the entire organization. It has to be something that's really needed into the, 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 um, the basis and the foundation of the organization, but it, representation, I do think is important. Yeah. I definitely feel that my editors at KPCC are very open to my pitches. You know, sometimes there's a back and forth. Sometimes there's, you know, good conflict is a strong word, but you know, a good conversation that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I feel heard, but I definitely think that the resources and the time constraint create, uh, especially for the types of beats that we're on. I mean, you're a white house correspondent that never stops. I mean, it doesn't matter what's going on. And, you know, I'm, I'm the politics reporter for all of Southern California that never stops. And so, um, you know, the idea that the ambition that we have is always greater than the resources. And we just have to find ways to meet that and, and make the time for that that deeper dive or that different perspective that is so important. Um, uh, along the lines of diverse voices, our wonderful SCPR board member, Capri Maddox. Uh, she's also a civil rights attorney and has done amazing work here in Los Angeles, um, is asking, I want to know how you uh, I set the tone for how female African-American reporters are recruited, treated, promoted, and given an adequate platform in the media? That's a, that's a good question. I, I, I think that I'm still trying to, to set the tone uh, for myself and, 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 and trying to, to um, but, but I also, I, what I try to do is, I, I feel like I, I want to help as many people as I can. So whether it's students or people that reach out to me for advice or who, you know, who want to get advice on a job or if I can be of help, I, I try to be as much help as I, as I possibly can uh, because I, I, I feel like I, I know the, the struggles that I went through. Um, in the industry and trying to figure it out. And I'm still trying to figure a lot of it out. Um, and I'm so grateful for those women in the industry and, and particularly, and it's it's been you know across the board, but definitely women of color who have black women who have lifted me up, who have supported me, who have given me advice um, and continue to give me advice. And, and I really appreciate that support and that sisterhood. And so that's, I, I want to try to always do that. I do think that a, a lot of it has to come from higher ups, people who, who do have hiring power. I, I don't have hiring power. So the people who have the hiring power have to really make it a priority. My understanding is that NPR at the, the national level, that they have made diversity a priority and that they have made a retention of diverse you know, of a diverse workforce, uh, a priority. And so it, it really has to, I think, come from the top um, with pushes from people who are in this space um, or in spaces like me. Um, but I think it really has to come from there to really make a difference um, because I can kind of 
say we need diverse voices everywhere I go and I do, but the people with the real power um, are, 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 you know, a, a, above me or, or at least in pay. Um, the, the pay is way above me. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's how you know. Yeah. That's how you know. So. Well, I, I agree. I also think that it's once you get somebody through the door, how do you make sure that person succeeds yeah. and that they are supported? Because so often it can stop with recruiting and it can stop mm-hmm. with, you know, uh, the, the orientation. And then mm-hmm. it's like sink or swim and you want that person to succeed and that, and you, to support those diverse employees all throughout their time. And that's the retention element, right? Is how do you make sure that that success is just grows and blossoms and becomes more and more. And, and, Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is, that's still an issue that public media is definitely grappling with. Um, and pay is part of it. You know, frankly, Mm -hmm. oftentimes we can't compete with network, um, uh, corporate media. And so, you know, the mission is great, but it doesn't pay the bills. And so Mm -hmm. when, you know, you, are thinking about making sure that people who maybe, you know, don't have a fallback, don't have like a a spouse who has, you know, a big income coming in, um, maybe have student loans. How do you, Mm -hmm. how do you keep those people in, in the business, in, in public media? I think that that's a conversation that we can definitely keep going and, and really lean into. Oh, I said, lean in. I didn't. I didn't mean to say (laughs) lean in. (laughs) Uh, Darren Jones says for Aisha, do you ever feel that it's all spin and no real news from the White House briefings? Yeah, certainly. I, I you know, they're, they're and as you know, and as journalists, we're very uh, cynical people, and so uh, there are plenty of days, especially when you actually have a daily briefing, where you feel like ah, you know, there's there wasn't any real news in this. They were just trying to, you know, get their point of view across. I, I, I do think though, especially at moments like this, when, you know, what is happening in that, what, you know, the end of the war in Afghanistan, I do think briefings take on more importance. Um, and I do think briefings are important because part of like what Libby said, you number one, you can see the progression of, the talking points or the stance of the administration, you can see a shift or you can see where they said that back then. And then you can ask them about that now. So some of it is, it's our job to be in the briefing every day. But if you're just, you know, popping into the briefing, you may not be too edified by it. Some of it comes from accumulation. It's you were in this briefing and you said this, and now, I, you know, it's weeks later and on the ground, we're seeing something totally different. And how can you, how do you explain that? So sometimes that is the, the benefit of a briefing. And I think that, a, I believe there is a benefit of, to a briefing to really trying to understand what is the White House position on this? What are they, this is their argument, right? They're putting forth their best argument. Now it may not hold water, It may not stand up to scrutiny. You put the light on it, it may fall apart, but this is is the argument. And so as a reporter, I want to have an understanding of what actually are you trying to achieve? What actually is your point? Because sometimes that can be very difficult to understand. What what are you trying to do? I don't get it. Um, And and so that can be the benefit of a briefing, but it's definitely spin and and, and you have to, to take that into account. Um, but sometimes it comes from following them from day to day. You can see a change, you can see a shift, um, and you can recognize that, oh, now the White House is looking at this, is talking about this in a different way. Why is that? Or they've had to adjust from where they were before. Yeah. And that's really the benefit of being on the beat, right? Is seeing yeah. that transition and and knowing it'll flag in your head if you're like, yeah. wait a second, you yeah. know, and, and that's yeah. really the benefit of the experience and just, and being there. Um, Sandy Adams asks, how concerned are you in voters focus more on social media than on fact-based reporting like you and NPR represent? Does that factor into how you work as a journalist? 
It definitely factors in. Um, if I can take this one first, uh, Sandy, I think about all the time how many people have been on Instagram today instead of tuning into the t television or radio or picking up a newspaper. We are trying all the time to have different ways to reach people on those platforms. We had some great TikTok videos from our engagement team over the, the last election. Um, we have some Instagram uh, swipe through stories to uh, talk about this recall election and the way that people can vote and making sure that they understand the process. Um, but it's really hard to compete when social media platforms are set up to have algorithms that promote outrage and things that provoke a lot of emotion. And that's not our goal. I mean, our goal is to tell stories that, you know, entertain and, and inform and delight you. And, you know, sometimes they'll strike a chord and, you know, oftentimes I hope they do, but our goal is not outrage. And mm -hmm. so many people who know how to game social media, that's, they know how to play that chord, you know, they know how to, how to pull those strings. And so I absolutely am concerned about the way that we consume media and inform ourselves. Um, Aisha that, I mean, I feel bleak about that, but <laughs> anything it, 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 you want to add? It's, it's very hard. People ask, talk about misinformation and how do you combat that? And I, I don't have really good answers for that. I, I've said you know, in the past, that I feel like there is a, a great deal of information out there, but there's, and, and people can find all sorts of stuff on the internet, but they can't necessarily find the truth. Uh, and so there is a, a problem where people can really kind of pick and choose what they want to hear, uh, what they want to, you know, what type of facts and information they want to consume that makes them feel good, that doesn't challenge them. Uh, and, and really confirms their biases and anything that doesn't line up with that, they will say it's it's fake. Um, and and so I don't I don't have a good answer for that. And like you said very well, is it's all about outrage online. What you know what's negative moves a lot faster online than anything that's positive. So it, it's it's a very tough climb that I think as a society we have to deal with. Yeah, we all are living in it, swimming in it, existing in it every single day. And it's, it's a collective and societal and governmental problem for sure. Um, our vice president of content, Kristen Muller is on the line. My boss is here. Uh, everybody <laughs> sit up straight. And she's asking, how do you balance coverage of politics with civics with, you know, coverage of like the way that the mechanics of how things work? Uh, I, 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 I think the best reporting will try to do a bit of both. I, I, I sometimes I do think you don't want to get too bogged down in minutia so that you lose people and people don't understand how this actually impacts their daily lives. Um, but I, I, I think what, what I would like to do is try to thread that needle where you're talking about the politics of stuff because that, that does matter, that does affect policy. But then also, and then talking about, well, this is how you, it, this would have to get done. Um, but then also trying to figure out like, how is this actually affecting people's lives? Like, this is why it matters. This is why the filibuster matters. This is why that can't get through Congress. This is why this would take a regulation or, you know, and once they do the regulation, then it has to be implemented and so on and so forth. But it's important to know that because ultimately this is how you would get this program or this is how this person would be able to get this loan or this grant or what have you. Um, and so hopefully I, I'm threading that needle of explaining, but also like connecting. Um, and that's that's what I hope to do and uh, trying to, to balance that. Yeah, the connection I think is is huge, right? Because you can have the mechanics and the civic side, but then when things happen, you have to explain what are those power dynamics that have yeah. driven this policy mm -hmm. and this law and, you know, whatever moves are being made are always informed by the money and the power behind them. Unfortunately, yeah. that's the, that's the world that we live in. And I, I totally hear that. Um, <laughs> somebody asks, um, Ms. Dankman, do you aspire to be a national correspondent in the future? Um, I am very happy with my position. I love my oh, job. You should, yeah. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, the other question, it was a dual question. 
Um, Miss Roscoe, do you aspire to be on television in the future? <laughs> You're on um, television a lot, but you know, I yeah, guess on a yeah. daily basis. Well, yeah, you know, I think the 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 blessing of this job is that I've been able to do radio. I'm able to cover really serious topics, also cover some fun topics like on Pop Culture Happy Hour. And I'm also able to be on CNN or be on, I was on Meet the Press once. That was, that was big. That happened recently. Uh, you know, so I'm able to do a mix of both. And sometimes my questions in the briefing room are picked up you know, by ABC News or, or what have you. And my, you know, my mom sees it and, and she's very excited. So um, yeah, I, I like being able to do a mix of both. I, I like that. Yeah, definitely. And hey, it, with radio, I've always loved that I can wear jeans sometimes to work. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I suppose at the White House, you that's frowned upon. You cannot do that. I'm sorry, Aisha. Not, no, not usually. Yeah, pretty has to be pretty, fair, not super dressed up, but you got to be dressed up a little bit. <laughs> your, your closet must be. So when I lived in D.C., my closet was full of, you know, the the West Wing approved <laughs> jackets have, and yeah. everything. Well, I don't do a lot of blazers, but I do the dresses because it's hot in the summer. So I yes. do that. Yes, yeah, so I make sure I have a lot of a lot of dresses. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Aisha Roscoe. Um, ending on a, a, a fashion note, as yes. I like to do. <laughs> Aisha Roscoe, White House correspondent for NPR News. It's amazing to have you uh, for our leadership circle here and also, you know, staff from KPCC were joining us because they just love your coverage and wanted to, you know, listen to you and, and hear your in insights. So, and thanks to everybody who asked a question today. Um, and it's been a wonderful evening. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you. Thanks everybody for having me. I, I appreciate it so much and, and support KPCC. Thanks everybody. Um, have a wonderful evening. Libby Dankman with KPCC and um, have a good night.